My name is James Friend and I was the cinematographer on All Quiet on the Western Front. My name is Sven Budemann, I'm the editor of the film. My name is Frank Kruse, I'm one of the sound designers on this film. Hi, I'm Christian Goldbeck, I'm the production designer on this film. Hi, my name is Volker Bertelmann and I'm the composer. Frank Petzold, I'm the visual effects supervisor and uh, me and my team were responsible for, yeah, for putting it all you know, I'll do all the magic on top of it. My name is Heike Merkel and I'm the hair and makeup designer. Hi, I'm Edward Berger and I'm the writer director of this film, All Quiet on the Western Front. And we picked a scene for you that really became the centerpiece of the movie. It, it became the centerpiece of the movie also because it's the centerpiece of the book. There's a scene in the book that is utterly amazing where Paul Boimer, the main character, dives into a crater uh, to hide from attacking planes and he is confronted with a French soldier, soldier, and he stabs him 10 times and watches him then, subsequently he watches him die and realizes that he's just another human being that he's killing. He's not an enemy, he's a human being, and that he himself has become a killing machine and he's lost his soul in a way. This scene, I, I, I kind of don't really see it as a scene in the film. I see it as a sequence in the film because it's, it's so iconic. This sequence was particularly challenging because obviously it's all set in a crater where you had to figure out how to go across a battlefield and then into the crater and and we were cutting it in our minds and we thought wouldn't it be really fun to take the audience therefore the camera with Paul Balmer running across the battlefield and jumping into the crater without an edit so we actually put Danny Bishop, our extraordinary um, a camera operator, in a stunt wire rig. He ran handheld after a stunt man and dived headfirst into the crater. And that's how we achieved that shot. And then when well, the, the other thing we wanted to do as well is, um, you know, I think Christian said, wouldn't it be great? You know, this is a, a, a you know, bad time of year and all aesthetically, wouldn't it be great if it was flooded? So we actually filled it about, I think, it, after our rainfall, we had about three foot of water in it as well. So it it became a very, very, very tricky, logistically um, challenging set, but very pleasing to sort of work in. Usually, you know, you want to crank it up. You want to be flashy, shiny, big, and, and the bigger, the better. And on this project, we really wanted to be photoreal and careful that we don't distract. So even starting with the planes, we uh, also, together with Christian, uh, had to, we wanted to be historically correct. And this time uh, in the early 1900s was just the breakthrough of planes. So it was really hard to figure out which planes were even in the sky at that time. And uh, so we also wanted to identify them as French planes. So uh, it, it was sort of a lot of research just going into those quick seconds of planes flying by. And then of course, with the planes, you have sort of the, uh, the result of the planes, we have a lot of like uh, um, a bullet hits in the ground just to make it a bit more, to even crank up the urgency for Paul, especially when he peeks um, over the edge. We had a beautiful, I, I, I called it the dirt crew, yeah? the, the, the greens department who was, not, I mean, they didn't do much green in this movie, as you can imagine, but they were taking care about kind of a realistic surface in the best possible way. And we had, uh, like high resolution photographs of 1917, 1918 of the no man's land and how those kind of layers of earth evolved from those craters. For us also in the technical aspect, very important kind of what kind of earth would give the actors kind of some comfort even to, especially in this scene, to be on top of it because the earth in general was very full of clay, very sticky, actually very dangerous. Yeah, the earth next to the um, soldier, what Paul grabbed to stuff into his mouth. So, and this, of course, it's not real. It was made out of like different kind of cookies and oatmeal so that in case he is swallowing it, it doesn't matter. So he can still like keep going and acting. For me, it was just important that every inch of the surface behind the actors was right. Uh, white stone particles, barbed wire particles, everything should be just perfectly in place. It, it, it's, it looks completely random, but it is, it is kind of, especially towards, for the surface, it was completely 
thoughtfully put there by a lot of wonderful crew members. When I saw that scene, it was for me in the beginning pretty difficult to find out where the level of music um, should, you know, um, how, how much I would emphasis on the emotion because every level or every inch that is too much um, would take away from the realistic acting and the, the breaths and uh, the gurgling and, you know, everything that is that you see. Um, you can destroy with music very quickly the intim intimacy between this or in this moment, which is very rough. So what I tried is I, I had this theme that I used already, you know, in the beginning, but now it was quite melodic with a string orchestra and we recorded this whole music f like with a full on 40 string orchestra um, and um, all sorts of sounds in there like droney sounds. And then I used the filter that cuts everything off. Uh, that makes that was dampening all the high end of the music. I think here it worked so nicely because we could hear um, on top of that we could hear every breath and every little sound um, that they were creating. And at the same time, it was a little bit like the inner voice uh, of Paul Bäumer in a way. <laughs> <laughs> Lizzie Crystal, our costume designer, uh, is such a perfectionist. She tests everything. And in this scene in particular, you see how Paul Boimer takes his knife and cuts off, he takes it, and the French guy thinks he's going to kill him, but in fact, he wants to open his uniform to service his wound, the pumping blood that Heike put there. So he takes a knife, and she, he cuts off the buttons. And these buttons, just imagine, you're in this crater, no one can get to it, it's watery, it's hard to work, it's cold, and you cut off buttons in a take. And every time you climb into this crater, it takes a long time for a wardrobe person to sew that button back on. And a, a crew of 150 people are standing around waiting for the person with cold fingers trying to sew a button back on. Of course, Lizzie had thought of that weeks before and she tested it and she developed a system of how to cut off a button, but how to press it back on within seconds. And so she thinks of these things technically and saying like, how, how do we reset the scene? Because he's gonna cut off seven buttons and I can't, I can't have someone sew on buttons for 15 minutes. So she really tested it and really helped saved our, uh, saved our, our, our work day. Otherwise it would have taken seven days to shoot the scene. Heike, maybe you can tell, tell us about your makeup. In our pre-production, we were already agreeing that they definitely all have to be dirty and muddy. And so like what kind of dirt and mud is existing? What is the color? What is the texture of? So what we did, like we had a whole like bunch of different textures of mud. So luckily we also had like, you know, the, because here the color in the end, it became a bit greenish, yellowish. And before we had like grays and whatever is existing in that full battlefield. It's a bit like an elephant skin or something, you know? Um, yeah, so that was um, a, a challenge on one point because also like the, the crater was so difficult to approach where they were. Um, and then this was not, was not the only one we had. We also had like blood pumps, you know, um, attached to the French soldiers jackets so that the blood is coming, pumping up, like, you know, in different levels. And then on the other hand, it's such an emotional scene and always disturbing basically the actors with technical things 
sometimes I, I really felt bad about and guilty. So hopefully they can keep going and stay in their, you know, situation. Um, and apart from this personal, um, I never cried on set by watching a scene. So it's, I mean, the scene is great. It was hard work and so emotional that I still can cry, you know, just by watching it. I'm really glad to hear that um, I'm not the that I'm not the only one who cried when watching the scene for the first time. That <laughs> there's Heike. Um, I remember when I watched the first take, I was truly affected, and I was, and I fe felt uneasy for hours after watching it. And um, the whole scene exposes um, the brutal nature of war and the lost humanity in such clarity that it was hard to bear for me. My first intention was to let it all play out in a one take. Sorry for you guys working on the storyboard, but I, I, my impression was it was so strong. So I want to keep it like that. But um, the truth is that we had tons of great footage and we spent a lot of time to bring out the best performances and tickle out every detail to make the scene as compelling as possible. And um, for me, this is probably one of the most crucial scenes in the film. I um, also remember that our intention was to play out the scene in real time without shortening anything so that the audience has to experience the same emotional development that Paul goes through um, with no way of escaping. And um, after this intense scene, uh, we felt like that we needed a break to give a rest and a moment of grounding. I remember that it was clear to us that we have to embrace every little moment, every little positive moment in between all the brutality and at the end of the scene, um, the battle seems to be over and we cut back to Paul. And here we have one of these rare moments of hope. And when you listen really carefully, you can even hear some birds chirping in the background. It's pretty much the original performance that's in that scene. So, and that carries us through that, you know, this traumatic scene. And then the idea with the birds came up uh, to create this surreal moment where he wakes up almost like in a in a real dream, try to keep it realistic, which is the overall idea of the soundtrack of this film, really. And then, yeah, kind of the idea came up to use these swifts, the, the, the birds that you're hearing are mostly swifts, which kind of have, uh, you know, they, they spend most of their lives in the air, they rarely land. And once they land, it's very difficult for them to restart again. So it has this kind of also metaphorical, uh, let's say, meaning or energy in, in that short moment as well. So that's kind of the idea behind those birds in that scene. And Felix was acting it. And at some point he heard this noise from off camera and he was wondering what it was. And he realized, he looked up and he realized it was the operator crying while he watched him. Danny Bishop, our cameraman from England. And you have to imagine we shot this scene, this movie in the Czech Republic um, in a country that was invaded twice by German troops with a largely Czech crew, German crew, people from France, England, a camera crew from England, Danny Bishop from England, whose grandfather had brought him up, who would fought in the war against the Germans, who brought him up hating the Germans. And now this Englishman and these Czech and these Germans and these French people, they're all coming together on former battleground and sort of filming this movie. And I think it had a profound influence on us and really brought us also together and really meant a lot that we were all able to work together on this.